Hi everyone, my name is Cody and I'm from beautiful BC, Canada. For as long as I can remember, I've always loved plants. And I've been an avid gardener for the last several years too. I have a great interest for unconventional gardening techniques because I've always tended to question why gardening arbitrarily has to be done in a certain way. I am a believer that traditional isn't always better, and this year in particular I'm really taking the plunge into unknown territory when it comes to experimenting with new methods that may or may not work. I am not an expert or a professional, but I'm learning as I go along, so please bear with me. I would love to share with you some of my ideas, my strategies, my knowledge, and most importantly, my plants. So let's get started, shall we? So here is my greenhouse. It's just a little 5x5 five five walk-in greenhouse that I've had for a few years now. I believe I got it from Wayfair a while back. Had to get a new cover this year because the old one was all torn and ripped and stuff like that. But anyways, here are my plants. Got a bunch of peppers and some tomatoes. Some eggplants. Also got some kale in here just using little toilet paper rolls as pots. Got some broccoli and some cauliflower in there. Over here I got some medicinal herbs it looks like. And also here is some gourds, some pumpkins, a chocolate mint. These probably need to be up potted soon. These are peppers, tomato. These are hackberries. They're a very interesting kind of a plant because they're actually a tree that makes stone fruit berries. Over here I got some cucumbers, a whole bunch of them. Just using solo cups as pots because they're way cheaper than actually buying pots. Like, I have some other pots around but I've had those for a while now so. But uh, it's just a just way to cut down on your cost, buy a bunch of solo cups and poke holes in the bottom and use them as pots. Yeah, some lemon balm down here and some strawberries. Now, I originally planted a whole bunch of strawberries indoors earlier this winter and most of them died, but these are pretty much the only survivors. Have more strawberries that started later indoors and they're doing fine because I've planted them a little bit differently. Here's one I'm probably most proud about is my asparagus. So it's apparently pretty tricky to grow from seed anyways, but it's a perennial so it needs to be placed in a spot in your garden where it's a permanent spot where, it, where, it, where it'll live all the time. And this is its first year, so I planted this in about February. And so you harvest it in about its third year of growth and it'll keep coming back for about 20 years, which is pretty amazing I think. Over here I got some lupins. Had lupins before but had them in a certain spot and last summer it got really really hot and I think it really killed them back because they weren't coming back this year, this spring. So I just decided to plant more and these are looking good so far I think. Here I got some skullcap herb. If, if you don't know what it is it's a it's a herbal product that's used for treating like anxiety and stress and all that kind of stuff. Helps with sleep and stuff. It's, it's a mint, just like a lot of herbs. And one thing you got to be careful about it is there's some evidence that it could cause problems with liver and stuff like that. But I've used a lot of it for a long time and I have no liver issues that I know of. So should be fine as long as you use in moderation. Here I got some catnip and I have other catnip growing but this is going somewhere else. This is bee balm which is another kind of mint and it's good for teas, good for bees, good for me. <laughs> yeah it's a good plant. It's a 
nice showy kind of a flowering herb so that's good more herbs in there some mountain mint which is just like a regular mint some wormwood which if you don't know is uh, that infamous plant that has been used for centuries to make absinthe I'm not sure if I'm actually going to attempt to make absinthe this year, it might be a little complicated, but definitely make a bitter tea or tincture just for uh, some, some kind of pick-me-up if I wanted to. It's a vervain, which is a good plant for pollinators. Here is amaranth, which is like a grain that's related to quinoa and spinach, and it grows really tall, so that'll be interesting. Here, they're not herbs. I, I think they're like a, it could be a squash, or I'm actually wondering if they're watermelons, because I have watermelons actually right here, and the leaves look pretty similar to those watermelons. Like, they're different from a squash, leaf or a pumpkin because these are the pumpkin leaves and they're a lot rounder so but these are more like separated so that's probably what that is which is good because I like to have more watermelons anyways uh oh looks like I need to water this white sage that's the ceremonial sage that you can that's used as smudge and you can basically use it as an incense there's a Japanese catnip. Now this is different from regular catnip in that it doesn't apparently attract cats is what they say. This is my first year growing it so I guess we'll have to wait and see. But I don't want cats in my catnip anyways because I like to use it for tea. And if cats get in it and roll in it and dot at it, it, it just ruins the plant and gets cat hairs all over and it makes it not good for tea. So. Hopefully this variety will keep cats at bay because they don't really care for it. So we'll see. It's actually a different species than regular catnip, but it's it's like a subspecies, I think. So that'll be interesting. Here is some stevia. So that's that plant that's used to make the natural sweeteners and stuff, the zero calorie sweeteners. Grown it last year and it did really well, so Excited to try it again this year. There's some motherwort, which is mostly actually used as a women's herb, but it's actually good for like, like it's good for your heart in general. Helps it be healthy and strong and stuff like that. So I just thought I'd grow it just because because I haven't grown it before. It's a it's a it's a nice herb just to have in the herb garden because it attracts bees and stuff like that and. It just looks nice. It actually kind of looks a little bit like like hemp in a way because it grows really tall and it, it just has that kind of look to it. But it's, I guess it smells more like a mint, so yeah. And here, got some butterfly peas. And that's basically a pea plant that makes blue flowers. You can make tea from the blue flowers. It makes your tea blue, it makes a blue tea. And if you add lemon juice to it, it turns bright pink, believe it or not. Some sort of chemical reaction with the lemon juice. Yeah, it's a coleus plant I've had for a year now. Here, I actually started these in sand, because apparently you can do that, and it's been working excellent for me. This is okra, so it's just starting to germinate. Planted it probably about a week ago. And that's a vegetable that grows pretty big. And I don't know if you know what okra is, but you can look it up if you want. Here's a bunch of cuttings I took from my grandma's garden last time I was there. She let me take some cuttings. So I just took some plants that I thought were interesting. I believe this one is feverfew, which is like a chamomile kind of a plant, only it's used for like treating fevers and like toothaches and headaches and stuff like that. So, but this one, where is it? This one right here, I'm not sure what that is. My, my best guess is tansy, but 
I really don't know. So if you know what this plant is, feel free to drop a comment. I got another one, bigger one right here, just for comparison. Really not sure. I don't think it's yarrow because it doesn't smell really much like yarrow and it's just looks different from what I've been used to seeing all my life. So yeah, I also got some peppermint and some some dead nettles in here. So just get it trying to get them to root in some sand and then I can plant them in my herb garden. Let's see how that works out. Here are some apples I saved from some store-bought apples and growing into little apple trees already. And here's an Asian pear, which is kind of like an apple, but tastes like a pear. And all along the bottom, I got all these tomatoes. Lots of tomatoes. Probably got it. Well, I gave a bunch away, but I probably have probably around a hundred in total. Yeah, so they're not huge yet, but they're they're coming along. It's still a little early in the season. It's it's May 1st today, so probably in another few weeks, so we'll be planting them out in the garden and they should be quite a bit bigger by then you would think. So that's normally how it goes. There's some celery. Planted a bunch of it, but most of it died, but these are the survivors, so should be the best of the stock anyways. So here I'm trying something a little bit different. Because pots are so expensive, I was scheming of ways to find what can I put my pepper plants and stuff in once they get bigger. And so I thought, couldn't I just use a regular grocery shopping bag for that? So I looked it up online and there wasn't a lot of people doing that. Or but I just decided, okay, I'm going to try this for myself. So I took two grocery shopping bags together, double bagged it, and then I folded it down kind of and added soil to it, poked some holes in the bottom, and planted my peppers in here. I'm not exactly sure if this will hold up in the weather, but I'm sure if it gets some rips or tears in it, I can just tape it up and I'm guessing I'll get a growing season out of it at least, so we'll see. Just an experiment. Here are a bunch of onions I'm growing in some sand. Should probably be transplanted soon. Just starting to pop up, but these are soybeans. So I can make my own tofu and my own soy milk and stuff like that. That'll be great. And this is how I keep my greenhouse warm at night. This is just a converted rain barrel from a trash can so it's got that little tap at the bottom and I'm using this right now as a heat sink to heat my greenhouse with so I got a submersible aquarium heater in in the bucket itself the buckets full of water the heater heats the water the water then heats the greenhouse and so at night I just close all these windows and doors and then I throw this blanket over top just to trap the heat in because heat rises right and my plants do excellent at night like we've been having a few nights below zero degrees celsius they've been doing just fine so the water itself is reading at wow whopping 34.8 it's not normally that warm but it's, it's a good system. It, it keeps my plants warm for sure. So I would estimate a lot of nights is probably around 10 degrees Celsius. So like in the greenhouse itself. And yeah, plants seem to be doing excellent with no signs of cold stress or anything like that. So yeah, so that's, so that's my greenhouse. And now I'll show you my herb garden. So this is my herb garden. There's not a whole lot going on in here yet. Like I got this netting I've had for a while for like vining plants. And used to be kind of a vegetable garden because I had kale in here last year and it's still coming back this year. But that's okay. I like kale so I'll leave that in there. And I had peas growing on this netting last year. 
but I recently just mulched this with old straw so that should help quite a bit with moisture retention and stuff like that and there's all this stuff which is known as creeping charlie also ale hoof or ground ivy and it's basically like a sprawling ground cover mint and it's pretty invasive and a lot of people including myself used to try to get rid of it but this year I think I'm just going to embrace this plant because it's it's a nice smelling plant and it looks pretty it's got nice little purple flowers on it good for bees and stuff like that and it's it's actually got a lot of medicinal uses to it so I think I'm just gonna kind of let this take over and just let it compete with my other herbs and I think that'll be a good thing here's a dandelion growing in my herb garden but I'm just gonna leave it here because it's actually a nice medicinal slash edible herb flowers can be just eaten as is or the leaves and the roots can be used as a coffee substitute and pollinators like bees like them a lot so that will attract pollinators to your garden even though the I don't know if you know but dandelions aren't actually as good for bees believe it or not like bees like them but they're kind of like junk food for bees in a way because they don't have the nutrients bees need to reproduce so if you have a whole bunch of dandelions on your lawn don't feel guilty about mowing your lawn every once in a while and don't feel the need to leave every single dandelion for every single bee because like th that's just not necessary there's other flowers around growing at the same time as dandelions which just like these ones which bees can easily find and are actually better nutritional wise for them compared to these dandelions although it's good to leave lots for bees because they're because they bees just like them anyways so yeah here is some Roman chamomile growing in the bricks, the holes in the cinder block brick garden. And it differs from regular chamomile, also known as German chamomile, in that this is a perennial. German chamomile or regular chamomile is an annual. So this comes back year after year. It actually stayed green all winter, believe it or not, under the snow. And it's coming back nice and strong this year. It's got the same similar looking flowers to regular chamomile only it has different medicinal uses like it's it's definitely got a more bitter taste than regular chamomile and it isn't as pleasant to drink although it can be very helpful in some ways so I guess you can make essential oils out of them too so I'll have to learn to do that. So. Yeah, so I just got a whole bunch of this Roman chamomile with like, it's a ground cover too, just like the Creeping Charlie. So this will eventually take over my garden bed too, so that'll be interesting to see how it looks in a little while. Just planted this last year, so it's the second year, so yeah. You may have noticed this cage in my herb garden. You're probably like, why is there a cage in your herb garden? Well, I'll tell you. This is protecting some of my plants, actually these catnip plants from neighborhood cats that I've had so many problems with in the past just coming into my herb garden and the cats decimating these plants. So as you may know catnip is a very attractive plant to cats and it makes them go crazy so the cats will find this catnip and they'll 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 eat it and they'll bat at it and they'll roll in it and they'll sniff it and just make a big mess like they would get cat hairs all over the plants and the plants will be all broken and just not good if you want to make tea out of it and I, I that's why I'm growing it is for tea and just for a relaxing kind of a tea and I'm just trying to keep it safe from the cats so they don't get at my my plants so 
if you're wondering how I can harvest them when they're in this cage like this, there's actually a door on the side. So I can just reach in and then do my harvesting and stuff like that. And I just close the door when I'm done. And the cats can hopefully not find their way in here. Like you may notice there's like stinging nettle growing around here too. That was an original deterrent type planted last year amongst my catnip to try to stop the cats from getting to my catnip and getting stung in the process, but it didn't phase them at all. They were just relentless with this stuff, so. Yeah, so hopefully between the cage and the stinging nettle around it, hopefully I won't have any problems with cats getting at my precious catnip plants. Here's some valerian, which is a flowering plant that often grows in like mountain alpine kind of meadows and stuff and it's a it's a sweet smelling flower but a lot of people don't like the smell of the roots it has a very earthy like some people even compare the smell of the roots to dirty feet which i don't think is very accurate but the roots are what you use for the medicinal part for the most part and they're used for tea and stuff so I planted these last spring and they came up last year, but this is their, their perennial, so this is their second year of growth. And it's the second year at least that you can harvest the roots from, so I'll probably harvest a few roots this year and leave some for following years. And apparently it spreads pretty good, so it might take over a little bit more. But what I just learned recently is that cats some cats that aren't affected by the catnip are actually affected by the valerian which I which I'm a little worried about because they could end up ruining my valerian plants which are outside the cage instead of my catnip as kind of like an alternative or something so I'll have to watch these ones pretty good but even if they do get at the leaves it might be harder for them to get up the roots, so I could still harvest the roots and they might be okay. So we'll see. Over here I got regular German chamomile. So the kind used in popular commercial teas and stuff like that. And that's an annual, so I had it planted here last year and it dropped its seeds and self-sowed and now it's growing back. It's all growing through this mulch right now. Here we got a bunch of comfrey, so that's a pretty unique kind of a plant. It doesn't have a heck of a lot of medicinal value or anything like that. It's not recommended you use it for teas, but it can be used as like a wash to heal broken bones if that were to ever tragically kind of happen. But other than that, this plant is makes an excellent thing called a chop and drop. So you basically, once the leaves get bigger, you cut them back and then tear them up and spread it all over the garden bed as a kind of a mulch and also a fertilizer for all the other plants that are growing here. So once it breaks down, it'll release lots of nutrients into the soil and make good, good healthy soil for all your plants, so yeah. Here are my hops, a famous plant that's used for brewing beer and stuff like that. It can also be used as tea, I, d I do that all the time. And unlike most people who grow these hops from already established rhizomes, I started these hops about three years ago from seeds. Like it's not usually recommended to do that because you can get both male and female plants and they can produce seedy hops that will make your beer a little not not as favorable for most brewing companies but I wouldn't mind seeds in my beer brew and I could even maybe plant those ones but this last year they didn't really make cones yet because I think they were still too small like I had them going up on a diagonal on these strings 
that are attached near the top of the near the roof there. So they go on an angle and then they attach to these spikes in the ground and the hops climb up these strings and strings probably about 12 to 15 feet long or something I think 12 feet something like that but these strings have broken over the winter so I'll need to replace them and yeah I think the hops should get a little bit bigger this year because this would be technically their would be their third year yeah third year of growth so maybe they'll if I'm lucky I'll get some cones this year and they might grow further up the string as well so may, maybe I'll end up making beer for my own hops this year that'd be pretty neat also yesterday just yesterday I decided to transplant some wild strawberries from this area because they grow all over the place and just put them in my herb garden just to see if I can get wild strawberries growing in my herb garden so we'll see how that works they so far they're doing fine so wild strawberries are a lot smaller than regular strawberries like they're they're pretty small compared to the ones you get at the grocery store or even ones that you might be growing in your own garden but they taste really good and I got this other strawberry plant that I transplanted from elsewhere in my garden this is a normal strawberry so I'm wondering if I could get them to cross pollinate and make a hybrid between wild and domestic strawberries we'll have to see how that works out that might make for interesting tasting strawberries I not sure what their characteristics would be but they might be medium sized I'm not sure here's a bunch of sage I planted last year and it's coming back nicely just regular garden cooking sage but I also like to use it for tea it makes a really good tea some more sage there some more there were pretty nice last year. I think I'll have to throw in a picture by or a few pictures of how this garden looked last year compared to and then I'll have to make updates of how it's gonna look this year. Some oregano that survived the winter just fine. Some parsley I don't actually remember planting that but maybe I did. This is my cold frame I built just last winter. So if you don't know what a cold frame is, it's basically like a little greenhouse they can grow plants in. So I built this out of an old dresser drawer and also an old window from the old dilapidated travel trailer. And it's got like just a little crank that you can open up the window with and it'll keep your plants safe from cold and frost and stuff so I planted these all these probably at the end of March and it's May right now here's how well they've grown they might even be starting to get a little too big for it so I'll have to harvest them pretty soon so here's some spinach here is some Swiss chard really good stuff first year growing Swiss chard I think The bok choy, which is a type of cabbage, brassica type plant. A little bit of lettuce over there. Took a while to start to grow. And here, I've been trying to root some cuttings from a Labrador tea plant. And because I had broke a stem, so I just thought I'd try to make cuttings from those stems try to get them to root but so far I don't think they've really rooted yet and I don't think they're actually really alive anymore so oh well I almost forgot to show you these boxes that I built so these are raised garden beds about four feet by four feet and I built them out of 
boards from pallets that I got from a local business in the area who was trying to give them away. So I got two of these built so far, reinforced on the sides with like boards and then they got other boards. So it's two boards high. I think it'll be great little garden beds to have. That's not going to be their permanent spot, I don't think. I'll probably put them somewhere, like maybe over there near where that compost pile is. They might do okay there, kind of out of the way there, I think. So here is our massive vegetable garden. This is where we plant all our vegetables pretty much. So our tomatoes and our beans and our squash and broccoli and all that good stuff. We originally started building this in 2020, the year of the pandemic. And it was a success that year. And this last year, we expanded a little more, so it goes even further out now. So there was a bunch of tomatoes over here that were staked up by just whatever we can find, old pieces of broken camping chairs and whatever, just to stake up the tomatoes. And there are some plants that were here last year that are coming back this year. So for example, these onions, which are, they weren't much of anything last year, but they're really taken off this year. So that's a good thing. So we'll obviously leave those in here when we, we haven't done anything with this garden yet this year, but we'll have to soon because planting season is just in a few weeks. So we kind of got to get a move on. There's also all these leeks. So planted them all around the border, just onions and leeks kind of around the whole garden bed. And these leeks are doing well too. So we'll leave them there too. Here's a bean pole which I fixed up and I'm gonna use it to grow some scarlet runners on, maybe maybe some cucumbers, possibly squash. You just have to string it up, but you get the idea. This is a Brussels sprout plant that's growing in this garden. And you might not believe this, but we planted this last year, last spring, and it didn't really produce any Brussels sprouts. We just left it there. And it survived the winter, like the whole winter, when these other Brussels sprout plants just died. And this one survived, like we probably had cold nights, like definitely probably down to minus 40. And like I know it was partially under the snow, but still like, can't believe how tough these brassicas can be. So I don't know if it's going to produce Brussels sprout, like actual Brussels sprouts this year, but I think we should probably leave this one here too, just to see how it does. Maybe grow more Brussels sprouts here as a comparison. So yeah, I just thought that was pretty cool. And the same thing is happening over here, believe it or not, with this cabbage. And this cabbage, planted a few cabbages here, but they did terrible last year. Like they didn't really amount to anything. Like they didn't get much bigger than this. And this one survived too. Like the, all these ones died. And there was, there was actually this one, tiny little guy that survived as well. The whole winter under the snow, minus 40 Celsius nights. And now look at it now. It's really perking up because it's spring and it's much warmer and I wonder if it'll actually amount to anything this year so I'm thinking we should leave this one too. This stuff is actually a pretty cool plant. It's called Black Medic and it's basically a type of clover. It's related to alfalfa and it's actually a very useful plant it's because it's a legume it actually fixes nitrogen into the soil. So 
if you can have this as a ground cover and it won't compete with your plants because it has such a deep straight down tap root and so it'll help with soil compaction and stuff so just having it there will make the soil naturally loosen up when you do decide to pull it and when you do it'll have all this nitrogen in the soil so this would be a good place to plant heavy feeders I think because there was all this black medic here so probably like maybe cucumbers might do well here or even heavy brassica feeders like like your broccolis and stuff like that he had the broccolis here last year but I don't think it would be a problem to move them here this year but there's a lot of weeds actually growing in here like there's lots of dandelions and stuff and if it were up to me I would personally leave them but this isn't really my garden to do that and I would leave them because they're really a, such a useful plant and they help with like soil compaction too and they do fix nutrients in the soil and I don't believe they actually compete with your vegetables as much as you would think they would like they grow everywhere else in nature and they don't really choke out other plants that are growing there and they attract pollinators but by that time when your vegetables need pollination they'd probably be mostly done and going to fluff but they are you can keep them like a vegetable they are really a type of lettuce basically so the leaves can be eaten much in the same way as lettuce and it's it's just a like it's totally edible and it really if it were up to me I would be growing them just like a regular vegetable which I'm gonna do in my herb garden if there any more pop up in there I'm just gonna leave them for for eating basically there's a few carrots growing in here too because we had all our carrots here and they're coming back and they they say with carrots if you want them to go to flower and then make seeds you have to leave them for their second year because that's when they do that in their second year they're like a biennial so in their first year they're grown for their edible roots but in their second year the roots aren't really good for eating like they're very woody and stuff but they're still good if you want to have carrot flowers and have them go to seed and then you can save the seeds and plant more of those same carrots so if I can convince my family to keep some of these carrots here at least, I think that would be a good thing. Also last year there was a whole bunch of beans growing here, just regular bush beans. And they're a legume too, so they fix nitrogen into the soil as well. So this would be a good place. I'm thinking here would be a great place to plant some tomatoes. That's what I'm thinking. because. Since the beans fix nitrogen, the tomatoes use a lot of nitrogen, so that would make sense to plant them here. We already had the tomatoes over there last year at the far end. And the first year, we actually had the tomatoes here. And then in the second year, we planted like pumpkins and squash and, and even corn in the corner here. <laughs> corner. And so that, this is probably very depleted of nutrients. So I think it would be a good idea to plant our beans here this year. I, I think that's the way it's going to have to go. And this is a good spot, I think, for the bean pole, which would have the scarlet runners. So, yeah, just something to think about, I guess. So this bush is a Labrador tea plant that I transplanted from the wild probably two years ago now. And... I thought here was a really good place to plant it because there's a natural underground spring here which I guess is a mineral spring I would guess it smells kind of sulfurish like it might be sulfur or some kind of mineral or something and since Labrador teeds are bog plants like they like 
peat bogs and swamps and stuff. I planted it here and it's doing really well. Like, and it's, it's looking pretty happy. Just last year it was flowering, so that was a surprise. Now I can show you a picture of that. It looked really pretty. This Labrador tea is a good plant to use for tea. In uh, fur trading days in early Canada, it was used as a substitute for black tea and green tea when supplies were limited and grows all over the country basically. And it's got a whole bunch of medicinal uses and yeah, it's a really good plant in general. Just be sure you don't drink too much of it or it can make you a little bit sick. In moderation, it's it's fine, just just like alcohol or any kind of drink like that, really. Here, I think, is a pretty fine example of permaculture because this water that's coming from the underground spring where I have this Labrador tea is flowing down into this garden patch, watering my poppies. And so I won't have to water these poppies as often because it's already getting watered. See, the ground's pretty moist still. And poppies are actually, they like drier conditions anyway, so that actually works out pretty well. I got a whole bunch of little red seed poppies all over the place. It's actually a lot of them coming up right there. I don't know if you can see that well. And so I think a lot of people, if they saw this coming up in their lawn, all this water, they tried to dig it up and stop the flow somehow and but I'm using this to my advantage by having it water this bog plant and then also watering my poppy plants. So I think this is more of a blessing than anything. Here's a patch of stinging nettle, one of many patches of stinging nettle around the yard. And it's a very useful plant, believe it or not. Like, a lot of people hate it because they touch it and they get stung and then they fight to try to remove it and they get stung even more. And, but really, it doesn't have to be that way. You can use this plant to your advantage in a lot of ways. Like, it's, it's an ex excellent food, just if you want to eat, you can cook them and fry them and saute them and it makes a good kind of a stir fry or whatever you want to use. Also makes an excellent tea. I've used the tea many times and it's good for things like inflammation and stuff like that. And you can also use this as a fertilizer. So you just pick a bunch of nettles and let it ferment in a bucket for a couple weeks and then strain the material and then you got a thick fertilizer that you can use for adding nitrogen to more plants. Oh, there's a bee over there. I don't know if you can see it. Bee, bee. And anyways, the fertilizer has a really bad smell to it, but it works really well. Like, if plants have starting to get yellow leaves, it'll definitely help with that. So, something to keep in mind. I don't know what that bee's doing there. I don't know. If, I don't think bees pollinate stingy nettle. I think they're more of a wind pollination kind of a plant. It's probably just maybe has a nest down there somewhere. Should be a good place for them because bees sting and stinging nettle stings, so that'll be extra protection for that bee, I guess. Maybe. Maybe. And I've also got a pretty big project going on down here. So I got this, I'm making a raised bed with chicken wire borders, believe it or not. It's pretty unconventional, unconventional in my opinion. But this is actually a type of a Hugo culture style bed because it's got all those logs and sticks and leaves and grass clippings and all that kind of stuff underneath the soil. So that'll all break down over time and provide nutrients to the soil and then to the plants. 
and also those logs and bigger sticks will absorb water every time it, you water it or it rains and it'll absorb that moisture just like a sponge and then it'll release it back into the soil to then water your plants again so then you don't have to water your bed as often. So I'm just filling this basically with a mix of that, some of that compost and also some regular dirt from just right over here. So I'm going to have another garden bed here, about a 16 foot by 16 foot. And there was a whole bunch of roots in here, which I really wish I didn't have to dig them up, but I pretty much had to in order to get at the, at the dirt because there was just so much roots everywhere. So I, got, I think I got most of the roots now, so it should be fine to actually plant in, but I've been bringing some of that dirt over to the Hugel culture bed and I still need to fill the rest of it with that dirt so it's actually level with the top here. Then I think I'll plant some vegetables in here is what I think I'm going to do. So I'm actually half thinking I'm going to put my asparagus in here. It might do really well. We'll see. I'm going to plant a variety of things. So I actually got this ramp that I built out of a pallet a large board and some firewood basically so I can easily wheelbarrow up the loads of dirt and dump it in here without having to do so much shoveling all the time that works well so when I was digging over there there were all these wild violets growing around I believe they're wild violets and I didn't want to destroy them so I just transplanted them into this old dresser drawer that I'm gonna have as another kind of a garden and they're doing well for the most part like they're flowering and they, they seem pretty happy in here so they're all together in one place so. and there's also this bigger part of the dresser which I'm gonna I think I'm gonna actually fill this with that dirt and use it as a type of weed garden believe it or not so instead of pulling every weed I see in my regular gardens. I think I'm just going to transplant them and put them here just so they have somewhere to live. And a lot of those weeds that you might not necessarily like, but pollinators like bees and stuff like them more and they will find them more useful. So if I put a whole bunch of weeds here that will just be a, another spot to feed the bees basically. So it's all about feeding the bees. So here are most of the flower beds on the patio. And this year I'm actually doing something a little bit different with them. Instead of getting rid of all this dead plant material from last year, I'm just going to leave it for a variety of reasons. One, I can see a possible benefit is that it acts like a type of a mulch. So just like wood chips or just like like uh, straw clippings or whatever this will have like they'll cover the soil keep in moisture make it cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter and stuff like that and if you think about it that's how it happens in nature all the time like plants grow in the spring and summer then they die back in the fall and winter and then the next spring there's all this dead plant material everywhere on the ground and no one cleans it up but the plants grow from it just fine and another benefit I can see to this is as it breaks down it'll act as a type of compost so just like you're composting in place basically also a lot of these stems are actually homes for like solitary bees and other beneficial insects as a place to hibernate during the winter so that's why they say not to remove your plant material until the weather's warmed up like to a week of 10 degrees or something like that but I, I think if you were to just leave this stuff in here indefinitely 
It gives those pollinators and other things living in it a chance to sleep in for as long as they want and be comfortable. Because otherwise if you remove them early you're just basically like it's like a rude awakening for them and like get up and do your job right now but I think the more you let them sleep in and be happy and comfortable the more happy these bees are ultimately going to be pollinating your garden. And yet another reason why I'm leaving these dead plants in here is because of the seeds. So these plants went to seed last year and they have little seed pods and as these seed pods break down and decompose they'll release the seeds and then you'll have more plants. Now some people may say well wouldn't leaving those plants in there cause like plant diseases and stuff? Well I really don't think so. Like if you had healthy plants growing last year in that spot then where's the disease going to come from? But if you had diseased plants growing there the year before then it probably is best to get rid of them. Already got a lot of plants coming back already in. Some of them are not actual like plants that I planted there, like these mullins. I don't think I planted those. But they're a good plant for bees and also have many uses as well. So and I think they look nice and they're drought tolerant, so I think that'll be a good thing. Well thanks for hanging out with me today and I hope you enjoyed the tour of my gardens and the things that are going on around here. And until next time, happy growing!